Okay, so yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Sean Wellick, uh, who's a postdoctoral scholar at um, the University of Washington and also the Allen Institute for AI. Uh, and he's done a lot of great work on generating and reasoning with language. And I think uh, you'll be talking about some of that today. So um, yeah, that was great to ago. have you. Sorry? Wait, no, 3 p.m. Eastern time wasn't, yeah, 2 p.m. our time. Oh, oh, I think, sorry, what is there someone? Oh, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it's great to have you here and uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the uh, opportunity to give this talk. So um, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about some uh, exciting work we have on bridging informal and formal mathematical reasoning using these really large scale neural language models. Um, so just to start off, like in machine learning, we've seen uh, a lot of exciting progress and impact uh, in everything from science to engineering, where we have these uh, large models helping us write uh, code more quickly, um, and even to education, where um, AI is starting to have an impact in making uh, education more accessible and things easier to learn. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, mathematics, which is um, an interesting area because it intersects with all three of these. Um, as we kind of all know, math is a key tool in the scientific process. Um, it's useful for solving problems in engineering. Um, and it's also at the center of a lot of uh, uh, our education. And so AI is starting to have an impact in math as well, uh, ranging from discovering new algorithms to uh, even helping people write and uh, communicate proofs um, and also to help with learning something which is kind of infamously uh, difficult uh, to learn. Um, but I think that exciting, uh, there's also an exciting aspect which is that um, trying to build machine learning systems that are capable of doing sophisticated forms of mathematical reasoning um, actually requires us to solve some uh, core problems in AI. So for example, um, whether it's like solving a simple math word problem or trying to uh, teach someone math or write a sophisticated proof, uh, these all kind of draw on sophisticated uh, language understanding, um, problem solving abilities, as well as aspects of kind of symbolic reasoning. Uh, and all three of these are very much still um, you know, of, of interest and present, even with these really large scale uh, models that I'll be talking about today. Um, and so this talk is gonna focus on uh, one aspect of, of math, which is really central, and that is uh, mathematical proofs. So I want to start with a simple example um, and kind of, reflect on like, how do we actually know that one plus one equals two? Uh, and so what we can do is we could supply a proof that convinces ourselves or convinces someone else uh, that this is true. And so the proof could look something like this. Uh, you, we could say, you know, it's pretty obvious that if you pick up an apple and you pick up another one, then you've kind of picked up two apples. Um, on the other hand, we could kind of write down in uh, extreme detail in a logical formalism, um, a proof that one plus one equals two, uh, which was done here in this uh, Principia. And the kind of larger point that this is highlighting uh, is that when we think about um, writing these proofs, they kind of open up this spectrum between uh, the informal language, which is, intuitive but often ambiguous uh, and something that's formally specified in logic which is precise and explicit um, and so it turns out that like when we think about building uh, a machine learning system that could uh, write the type of proof here which could be useful say um, for a student who's struggling uh, while working on a proof like this in a textbook um, or like a proof that we see in uh, something like the International Math Olympiad, like the one shown here, um, this kind of tension between the informal and formal uh, is going to come up. 
And by that, I mean that like we could think about uh, building a system that can prove these things purely in the informal, ambiguous language space. Uh, and in that sense, we can just treat these mathematical problems as just sequences of, uh, of text and try to generate them with these really large language models. So what is a large language model? Uh, just to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, so at a high level, these are really large neural networks um, that are trained on kind of vast corpus uh, corpora of, of text. So this might be like a large proportion of uh, the internet, or it could be all the code on GitHub, et cetera. Uh, and the key idea behind how they're trained is to essentially uh, take each prefix in the text uh, and then just have them learn to predict the next token. And although this is uh, kind of conceptually simple, um, one way of thinking about what this is doing is it's actually training the model on a massive implicit mixture of, of tasks. Like here, we could say that this task that the model has to learn has to do something with, uh, you know, learning how to uh, engage in a dialogue. Um, and similarly, if we look at, say, a page from uh, uh, Wikipedia, then here, if, if the model is given this prefix, one plus one equals, uh, then arguably, like, forcing it to learn to predict two causes it to learn something, uh, whether it's, it's memorization or something more general. Um, about this mathematical fact. And so you can kind of imagine that if we have millions and billions of these tasks mixed throughout the training data, uh, then it's possible th that these language models uh, learn something uh, interesting. And so what we get at the end um, is a flexible generation system where we could essentially give it um, some arbitrary text uh, and have it generate some one or more completions. And so this kind of generic interface uh, is starting to be used for a variety of tasks. And so in the area of math, um, most of the work in, uh, uh, so yeah, these are, these are flexible. And in the area of math, most of the work, uh, at least in the natural language processing area, has been focused on these kind of grade school level math word problems. So these might involve like reading a, a few sentences that specify some problem uh, and then doing some arithmetic that kind of uh, parses the, uh, the, the problem that's inherent in the text and comes up with some solution. Um, and so as we scale these models up larger and larger and with some additional uh, uh, you know, like generation tricks that people have discovered, um, we're actually starting to see pretty reasonable performance on, on these types of tasks. But if we actually look at some of the uh, mistakes that these models make, um, it could lead to something more worrying if we're using them for more sophisticated tasks. So here, for example, um, we're basically showing uh, the intermediate uh, steps of reasoning generated by one of these really large language models. And so you can see that at the surface level, it generates this equation, um, which is really convincing. Three times 25 times eight equals 300. Uh, but then if you actually like run that through a calculator, uh, it's off by one digit. So the answer turns out to be 600, uh, which kind of makes it completely incorrect. Uh, and so even with these extremely large models, uh, it still turns out to be useful to kind of have them call out to some external calculator um, to do a, a simple computation like this. And so the question is like in more sophisticated settings, um, like say a mathematical proof, um, we might have kind of more generic uses of these uh, multi-step equations. And so it's not clear whether this kind of informal approach of just training on massive amounts of data um, will give us what's required to uh, do this type of, of um, generation or, <clears throat> or reasoning. Another example, we can look at um, an output from a dialogue model. And again, both these are taken from uh, 
from, from actual papers. So here the model um, says, you know, my favorite Elvis song is Love Me Do. And it turns out that this was actually released in a completely different day um, by the Beatles. <laughs> and so basically what the model did is kind of hallucinate uh, some, some fact, which again, at the surface level looks, you know, pretty, pretty nice. Um, and so again, even with these extremely large models, um, it's still useful uh, usually to have some form of retrieval, um, either like a separate retrieval model or even like a call to a search API. And it turns out that like in these proofs, there's kind of an analogous situation where a proof might refer to some previous theorem or some previous mathematical fact. And so the question is like, will the model um, have enough kind of grounding to be able to memorize all these and use them uh, correctly without hallucinating things that are uh, just false? Um, so I use this word grounding, and this is kind of just a useful phrase to summarize uh, cases like this, where um, the model kind of learns to imitate a lot of text, uh, but it doesn't have the kind of deeper form of grounding that like a calculator would have for a simple um, computation or that uh, we could get by like a retrieval system, which actually looks at a document related to a fact. So the first part of the talk um, uh, is going to look into this question of trying to prove theorems just informally and try to add additional forms of grounding uh, through background documents. Then in the second part of the talk, um, I'll talk about some uh, really recent work that we've done on trying to get really strong forms of, of grounding by actually taking informal proofs and um, translating them into formal verifiable proofs. So on the informal side, the first thing that we did was um, take the largest language model that was available to us um, so if you've heard of these GPT-3 models uh, and fine tune them on a data set of uh, theorem and proof pairs. So a couple of years ago, we had uh, assembled a data set, which basically takes a about 20,000 theorems and proofs uh, from the site called ProofWiki. And you can kind of tell by the, um, by the blue text that this is similar to Wikipedia, except for math proofs and it kind of links to other pages uh, within the system. Um, so then if you use this model uh, after doing this fine tuning procedure to try to prove some new unseen theorems, um, and we kind of ensured that the unseen ones were split in an uh, in intelligent way, um, along with its kind of like standard approach to generation, which is just selecting the most probable next token, um, then it starts to generate something which looks kind of reasonable. So it says, you know, we're going to start a proof by contradiction and suppose X plus five is even. Um, then it uses the definition of, of even integer. But then on the third line, um, it actually invents this fact that an odd integer plus an odd integer is odd. Um, and so if you think about like three plus three, that equals six, which is even. So this is just completely false. <laughs> and so it's kind of an analogy to the case we saw before where the model kind of invented some fact about, uh, about Elvis. So then like as a result, the resulting proof uh, to a human is going to be invalid. So to, um, to overcome this a bit, we uh, look into adding additional uh, grounding in the form of, of uh, references from ProofWiki, and then use uh, a more sophisticated search procedure for ensuring that these references are included in the proof. So what do I mean by that? So here uh, we now additionally uh, give the model at training time and at generation time um, a set of references, so definitions or theorems that um, are relevant for the proof that it's writing. And so here in this example, we have uh, like the definition of odd integer 
uh, and proof by contradiction. Uh, and in more sophisticated proofs, uh, this might involve like previous theorems um, or uh, you know more arcane definitions. Um, and so these can either come from a retrieval model uh, that we've trained to retrieve things that are relevant to a proof, um, or they could come from a human. So we could use a human written proof to uh, get these useful references um, or use the system sort of interactively. Um, then we do a, a kind of less uh, naive search procedure to, to generate the proof. Um, and I won't go into too many, into much detail here, but the idea is we basically uh, generate multiple steps, uh, multiple next step candidates. Um, and then we choose next steps based on how many references uh, they contain. Uh, so in other words, like we do this kind of beam search procedure and um, score the different candidates uh, based on their reference coverage. And so with these two components in place, um, we can look at this uh, example again. And it kind of starts off the proof in a, a similar way. Um, but now instead of hallucinating the fact at this step, it kind of concludes that um, the previous step uh, results in a contradiction uh, and then concludes the proof. So now, like we want to um, quantify these differences uh, uh, more systematically. So uh, we used um, uh, auto automatic metrics like during model development, but then we actually did a human study with 15 uh, mathematics students from University of Washington. So these were uh, undergrads, master's students, and PhD students. Um, and we kind of held a training session and built an entire interface for annotating uh, each step of these proofs um, and a rating of whether they were correct or useful. And so um, here we can see that, for instance, um, the GPT-3 model in blue uh, ends up being like much less uh, correct and useful than these uh, uh, like knowledge grounded models. And so here usefulness means that um, the proof might be slightly incorrect, um, but the annotators asked to say like, if they were approving the theorem on their own, uh, would this still serve as a kind of useful hint um, for proving it. And so you could see here that um, kind of adding in the search as well as the knowledge grounding uh, leads to more correct and useful proofs. Um, and so this was kind of surprising going in because um, uh, this problem kind of hadn't been studied and we really weren't sure uh, whether anything from these models was going to be correct and useful. Um, on the other hand, you can see that like they're far from perfect. And this was on a kind of held out uh, a, a, a smaller subset of the proof wiki that we held up for evaluation. So I'll talk about the limitations uh, in, in a second, um, but like this type of system uh, could be potentially useful in some interactive setting. So we started to look uh, into this and we're actually, um, still looking into this further, where we use our system to kind of propose multiple next steps in a proof. Uh, and then we can have a human uh, interactively choose which ones that they prefer. Uh, and so in this sense, like the model is still able to make mistakes, uh, but as long as something reasonable is within its top few predictions, uh, then this could potentially be uh, helpful as like an interactive tool for um, working on these types of theorems. Um, so the other thing that our study kind of revealed is that um, although these models are capable of proving some theorems, um, there is still an issue of like trusting their outputs. Uh, so in two different senses. So um, 
the two methods that we introduced uh, do reduce the reasoning errors. So here's like reference related errors, equation related errors, and other things like skipping steps, et cetera. Um, however, you can see that like the error rate is still um, above zero. And in these proofs, it's often kind of tricky to tell whether something is incorrect or correct. And so one option is again, to use this as some interactive system. Um, but we could ask the question of like, what if we want these systems to um, prove like long and complicated theorems? Uh, then this issue of trustworthiness uh, kind of comes up. So here's an example where, for instance, um, the difference between this incorrect proof and the correct one uh, is very subtle. So it turns out that like this rule only allows you to conclude that minus zero is greater than minus one. And so saying minus one is less than zero is actually incorrect in this, in this context. And so like the larger uh, idea is that, um, you know, within these sophisticated proofs, the model might still make slight mistakes um, that could become hard to detect. And so another question is like, you know, does this go away if we just make the model really, really large? And so for that, there's kind of a useful um, case study recently. So uh, Google developed this model called Minerva which is massive. So it's over 500 billion parameters. And they essentially train it on um, massive amounts of uh, math-related text from the, inter uh, from the internet, uh, as well as archive. And um, this model, again, showed some very impressive capabilities. Um, but we can still look at some of its predictions and see uh, these types of the yeah. same fundamental type of error popping up. Uh, so here, for instance, the model gives you a correct answer to this question. But then if you actually look at its intermediate reasoning, uh, it, con it contains an error. So here, for instance, like this computation is incorrect. Um, but as they get more sophisticated, it's often difficult to even tell like which part is incorrect without really deeply thinking about the output. And what they showed is that actually these kind of false positives increase with the difficulty of the problem. And so in other words, like if we use, as we start using these for more sophisticated things, uh, then this issue of trustworthiness uh, actually becomes more and more, um, uh, you know, of an issue. Uh, sorry, there, there was a question about, I think, a few slides ago, the user study that you talked about. Someone asked if it um, includes proofs that appear in the training sets or if it's like test set. Oh, OK, yeah. So what we did is we um, we look at the reference structure in ProofWiki, and we basically have test theorems that are leaf nodes. So they've never been, they don't appear in the training set and they've never even been referenced by other theorems in the training set. So <laughs> they're kind of completely uh, unseen. OK, thanks. Um, and, so, um, and so this kind of motivates uh, getting some stronger form of, of grounding. And so for that, I'm going to talk about uh, our next project, which tries to go from this informal space uh, where we can do this flexible form of generation uh, to a formal proof system, uh, which has a strong form of uh, logical grounding and verifiability. So, so what does this formal system uh, look like? So um, just to make sure like everyone is, is on the same page with these, let me just give a brief uh, high level introduction to these. So, in the kind of modern day, uh, we don't do what was done in 1910 and write down things in 100 pages of logic. We can use these formal proof assistants or interactive theorem provers. Um, so like if you've heard of like the lean prover or Isabel, uh, these are some, uh, or Koch, these are some uh, popular proof assistants. And basically the math is written in a program-like language. And then, 
at a high level, you could think of writing a proof as being similar to some game where we basically take different moves and it translates and it transforms the current goal. So here, for instance, the move that we took was to flip the right-hand side of the equation. And then we can take another move, which kind of subtracts both sides. And that gives us something which is trivial for the system. And so the idea is like this entire chain uh, is grounded in some underlying logical formalism. Uh, and so we're able to verify whether this proof is uh, correct. And then we can ask the question of like, how can we automatically prove uh, things similar to what we were trying to do in natural language? So there's been a kind of rich literature on automating uh, these formal proofs. And an example that we'll use here uh, is called Sledgehammer. Uh, this is an Is Isabel proof assistant. And you could think of what this is doing as basically taking the current theorem that you have, um, compiling it down, and then calling a bunch of external provers. So one's based on first order or higher order logic, uh, SMT solvers, and things like that. And this can actually be really useful as you're using one of these systems uh, to write a proof yourself. However, if we look at kind of uh, some real theorems, then we might want to get to something like, uh, which is shown on the right-hand side. And it's kind of dimmed out because we shouldn't try reading the whole thing right now. Um, but the idea is like the search space to arrive at this proof is incredibly large. And so, these types of methods like Sledgehammer um, would be insufficient for fully proving this theorem uh, from scratch. And so instead, um, some recent work has actually used language models to try to suggest next steps in these proofs. Um, and so here, this kind of cuts down the search space by having the model suggest next steps. Um, but we again run into uh, a kind of issue with these methods. So unlike in the informal space where we can draw on say like all of archive or all math web pages, uh, these formal libraries of mathematics are relatively small. And so, so far, um, most of the, or essentially like all of the work in this area in using these language models have used really small models within a kind of sophisticated tree search procedure. And in particular, they haven't drawn on these really large uh, language models, which kind of generate things in one shot. Um, was there another question in the chat? Let me see. Oh, just saying thanks. Sounds good. Um, so what we're gonna look into is trying to get the kind of best of both worlds and integrate these larger language models uh, for writing these formal proofs. Okay, so I'm just gonna put one more example up here and I know it's, uh, it's kind of the most uh, theorems you've maybe had to prove during a talk, but so this one just has to do with uh, greatest common divisors and least common multiples. Uh, and you, you basically wanna prove that the number is equal to 70. So in our um, pipeline, we have a multiple stage procedure. And so the first step is going to be to generate some informal proof uh, using, like in our experiments, we use this really large Minerva model, but instead of considering it as being the final output, we're just gonna consider it as being a draft. Then we use the draft to create a high level proof sketch. And so what is a proof sketch? So a proof sketch um, is kind of guided by contents in the informal proof. So here, for instance, this equation 10 times 280 uh, is basically taken from the inform informal proof. But you could see that the lower level proof of this uh, kind of smaller conjecture here um, is left unspecified. And so if you do this for the entire proof draft, now we kind of have the skeleton of the high level steps with the lower level details of how to prove those steps um, uh, 
you know, left left to be uh, proven. Wait, how, how did you extract these intermediate steps from the informal draft? Is that a, an automatic thing that? Yeah, so, so I'll explain that in a second. Okay. So yeah, it's supposed to raise a sense of uh, mystery and how it's done. <laughs> um, but then like, suppose we have this, then the idea is like, what this does is it essentially cuts down the search space into these smaller steps that become uh, tractable for even these off the shelf uh, methods like sledgehammer. Um, and then at the end, we have something which is fully uh, verifiable. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. So the, in Sledgehammer, you're just trying to show that the previous statement proves the next statement. Is that is that true? Um, yeah. So basically, here, if you look at C two, then it's just trying to prove the statement in C two, given everything previous. Oh, everything previous. It's not local. Proofs are yeah. generally local. So I'm just wondering if you're using the practice. Um, yeah, so this is able to refer to, for instance, C1 in proving C2. Thank you. Um, then another uh, thing that I forgot to put in the slide is we also assume that the formal statement is uh, given. So I'll have an example later. So we have like the informal statement of the theorem and the formal statement, and we're trying to come up with the formal proof. Um, so then, yeah, these are the, the kind of three components. And there's this question of where do we get these, uh, how do we do this mapping between drafts and sketches? And in particular, in particular, like this paired data of drafting and sketching just doesn't exist. So typically like in translation, if we want to translate between English and French, we assemble a paired data set and train a model but this doesn't exist in our case. Um, so we're going to build upon a kind of simple but surprising uh, finding in the past couple of years, uh, which is that we can use these large language models to actually quickly learn to do these tasks. Um, so in particular, we use this, uh, this model called Codex, which is trained on uh, a large amount of code so something like all of GitHub. And um, you know, what's been found for these types of large language models is that certain tasks, they're able to learn just uh, in context. And so what does that mean? It means that we provide just a few input output examples, uh, then provide them with some test input, uh, and then have them produce some test output. And so what we found here is that um, surprisingly, like this codex model is actually able to learn to do the sketching through just a few examples that we provide uh, in its context. So again, um, if you want, I'm gonna show the details here. If not, then feel free to tune in in, in like 30 seconds. But here's like what we actually um, would give the model. Oh, uh, yeah, here it is. So you could see here that we give it the informal statement, uh, then an informal proof. And then here's an example uh, proof sketch that we give. So you could see that like we have the statement of the problem uh, and then the sketch, which has comments that kind of align the uh, informal proof with uh, what is shown in the formal proof. Then uh, these, these uh, little red indicators uh, just mean that that's what's left for the automated system to fill in. And so what we essentially do is write 20 of these examples. Um, so we wrote like 10 number theory ones and 10 algebra. Um, and it also turned out to be important to have these comments uh, which show the alignment. Uh, and then we essentially just take three of them at random um, and provide the model with some new statement and informal proof and have it generate a sketch. 
and uh and just to make sure this is like the gpt style like you're not fine-tuning the model this is just providing it in the prompt exactly yeah just I in the prompt. yeah <laughs> um so yeah certainly in the future uh it, it it's going to be interesting to try to train a model to do this and typically like if you have a task and you're able to um assemble enough data then we're still able to beat the few shot models uh but at least here um we're able to just draw on this few shot uh learning capability um so these are the three components so we have the minerva model or you can use a human written proof uh we have this um sketching model which is codex and then we have the um automated prover uh, and we use sledgehammer. And what's nice is we can actually draw on the fact that everything at the end is verified and generate like many, many candidates. So specifically, like we can generate many, many potential proofs, uh, many, many sketches, and then just try to verify them all and see if anyone uh, checks out. And so that's um, our, our approach. And then um, just as a kind of summary, uh, you know, this does draw on these really large language models that are operating in this informal space. Um, and then at the end, we get a formal proof, which uh, is, uh, you know, in some sense uh, grounded. So to evaluate this, um, we used, a, uh, the standard benchmark in this uh, uh, formal theorem proving, uh, mathematical formal theorem proving area. And it consists of about 500 problems from uh, math competitions. So AMC or International Math Olympiad, uh, as well as some from undergraduate level uh, courses. Uh, then we use this proof assistant called uh, Isabel. And so Isabel has this uh, sledgehammer functionality uh, that I that I mentioned before. And the style is, um, if you've been looking at the examples, this kind of declarative style where you can have these intermediate conjectures um, that uh, such that it's kind of possible to have this alignment between the informal and formal. And then as our baselines, uh, we're just going to try to prove these theorems directly with sledgehammer, as well as some common heuristics, um, and also compare it against the current state of the art for uh, the mathematical theorem proving in Isabel. And how you can think about the state of the art method is it's essentially trained on uh, the available Isabel data, so the archive of, of formal proofs, uh, and then it's additionally trained um, with a reinforcement learning like procedure. So specifically, it's called expert iteration um, on additional data. And so this is a, a kind of strong baseline for operating purely in the uh, formal space. Uh, so there was, a, uh, I think, two questions. First of all, someone asked how you handle errors in the, gen in the sketches generated by codex. So if they're syntax or semantic errors, do you do anything oh. about those or? Yeah, so um, so I guess two things. So first is the sketch uh, still has to be closed by the formal prover. Um, so if the formal prover fails to you know parse the theorem, then it would just be discarded from the search. Does that make sense? Um, as in you'll just give up or you'll for that problem, or will you try a different? strategy to solve it yeah so um so in our system we'll generate a uh, hundred different candidates so a hundred different sketch candidates okay got it um and then if one of them say has a syntactic error then it'll just get filtered out because it won't be able to be closed in the end got it and then yeah there was one more question did you use any special sampling techniques to improve the diversity or coverage of the um, um yeah that's a good that's a good question so we experimented with a few things so 
but all of them fairly fairly simple. So uh, with these models, you can adjust the sampling temperature, uh, which means that like if you go to a lower temperature, then it'll be more focused on uh, things that are more probable, but you'll have less diversity. Um, and on the other hand, you can increase the temperature and get more diversity, but then they might be kind of lower probability. Uh, so we tried a few different temperatures, and then we also tried um, just randomizing the uh, the set of three prompt instances. And so in the end, uh, what we actually do is uh, select three instances randomly, uh, and then use a fairly low temperature. And so a lot of the ran the randomness comes from just the selection of prompts actually. And we found that this like this versus adjusting the temperature uh, end up performing uh, roughly similarly. Great, thanks. Um, but yeah, there's definitely uh, more, more to be explored there. Um, so then, yeah, you can see that here, if you use the sledgehammer procedure, like we were saying before, uh, it is able to prove some of them, but it's, it's far below what the uh, kind of neural prover can do. Um, then if you use our, our pipeline, here's using model generated uh, informal proofs, uh, then it's able to exceed the uh, state of the art uh, here in Isabel. Um, so one question is like, what if we use codex to just generate the proof directly uh, instead of generating a sketch and then calling uh, the, autom the automated prover. Um, so this turns out to do much worse than doing the intermediate sketch. Um, and I'll show an example later, maybe I should put it now. I'll, I'll show an example later that gives you an intuition uh, for why this is the case. Essentially, like some of these lower level proofs probably don't appear uh, almost anywhere in you know, Codex's training set. Um, another thing that we found is that getting these drafts from the neural system um, can actually solve the same amount or even more problems than using a human written draft. Um, so what we do here is uh, in the orange line, we essentially use Minerva to generate many, many informal proofs and then just translate them into one sketch. Uh, whereas with a human proof, we translate it into many, many sketches and kind of keep the um, budget the same. And so you can see as you increase the number of attempts on the x-axis, uh, the two lines eventually meet. And if you uh, generate like over 130 different possible informal proofs, uh, we, essentially, uh, we eventually slightly outperform using a human proof. And kind of both settings are interesting because um, a lot of the time, uh, uh, you know, there's several projects aimed at formalizing uh, mathematics. And so sometimes in practice, you'll, you'll have a human written informal proof. Uh, and so this blue line is showing that, um, uh, you know, our system could be useful for, the, for those settings. Um, this one is, uh, again, just how to allocate the sketching budget. Uh, maybe I'll um, just skip over this one quickly. But we, we essentially found that uh, generating more, uh, more drafts ends up being slightly better. Um, but if, if everyone is still uh, with me, I wanted to step through a kind of sophisticated uh, example just to give you an idea of uh, something that the system could do. So here, for instance, is a, a problem from uh, the first International Math Olympiad. Um, and so the problem is to prove that this fraction here is irreducible for every natural number. And so first we can look at the informal proof, uh, which was generated by uh, the Minerva model. Uh, and if you were to kind of step through the proof, uh, then it turns out to be, um, you know, a, a valid proof. 
Um, but let's look at how it actually gets translated into a sketch and eventually uh, into a formal proof. So again, the system is uh, given the formal statement. Uh, and again, this comes from the benchmark and the benchmark uh, gives us the statement of showing that the greatest common denominator of these two numbers, of these two uh, things is equal to one. And you could see here at the first step, uh, the sketch model um, kind of indicates this alignment between the formal proof and then something that appears in the informal one. Uh, then for this step, the, the formal part is fairly simple. The sledgehammer just calls this uh, uh, kind of built-in heuristic called auto, and it's able to move to the next step. Then if we roll out the entire thing, you can see this interleaving of the blue, which is the sketching, and the purple, which is the formal proving. Um, so for instance, here again, we see uh, this uh, alignment. And here um, we can see a kind of sophisticated, uh, more sophisticated lower level proof found by Sledgehammer. Uh, and so this can give some intuition why uh, you know, using the large neural model to directly prove the theorem, um, uh, you know, some intuition for why that might be much worse than our kind of pipelines approach. Um, this kind of complicated composition of these low-level facts probably doesn't occur uh, much or at all on the on the internet, um, and so it's difficult to kind of fully learn this behavior to the same level that the symbolic. Uh, uh, procedure knows how to do it. Um, okay, so in summary, uh, if we kind of zoom out, uh, what we found is that these really large language models um, are to some extent capable of proving some sophisticated uh, mathematical theorems. And as we discussed throughout the talk, um, the kind of key words here are capable and some. And there's always gonna be a trade-off between the flexibility of the system and then how much we can trust its outputs. Uh, and of course, this trade-off comes up in many different places uh, as we think about using these generative models. Uh, for instance, in code generation, we could imagine having provably correct code versus uh, like sampling from a generative model and putting it into our production system. Uh, and so, uh, you know, thinking about these trade-offs really is becoming more and more relevant as these generative models uh, become more powerful. Uh, then we showed that um, this idea of sketching uh, helps to bridge the gap between this informal space and the formal grounded space. And there, if we kind of zoom out and think about how to interpret what the language model is doing, then it's kind of um, serving as uh, providing this kind of high level sketch of what the formal proof should do and leaving some of the details uh, left to um, the automated provers. Um, so I just wanted to briefly comment on uh, just like three different uh, areas for the future. So one is uh, just staying specific to this math setting. Um, one area is to branch out in the generality. So with these competition problems, they're still fairly in a limited uh, domain. They're kind of designed not to, for instance, like refer to some theorem from topology. Um, whereas something like proof wiki or a math textbook uh, could draw on and test additional background knowledge, which would introduce new challenges for these models. Uh, and then similarly, uh, being able to formalize things from a textbook, for instance, uh, again, uh, makes these systems more useful for um, people interested in uh, formalizing mathematics. Another area, um, another way of uh, looking at this is that, um, you know, we have to think about how we improve these systems further after we, for instance, trained on uh, all the text on the internet. And so there we could look to additional forms of feedback. 
Um, and so here we could think about the formal system potentially providing some feedback signal that could be used to update either the formal model, the translator, or the um, informal model. Um, or our kind of initial exploration with the human collaboration uh, could also lead to additional forms of feedback uh, from a human. And then third, uh, just a higher level comment, which is like uh, one thing that we showed is that um, actually decomposing the system into uh, three different parts uh, led to an overall system that was more capable. Uh, and so um, these larger and larger language models are very, very exciting. Um, but at the same time, like it's also exciting to think about these models as being one part of some larger system. Uh, and so there, uh, the balance that we have to figure out is like which part should be uh, neural, which parts should be symbolic, and how to get these systems to uh, interact with each other. Um, and so both of these projects were uh, uh, big team efforts. And so uh, a big thank you to all my collaborators. And it was a lot of fun working on these. And um, you could see the links to the two papers at the bottom. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks so much for the great talk. Uh, so I think there were two uh, questions that we didn't get to in the chat. So the first one was asking, um, how do you handle generalization for proof techniques? So um, for example, assuming that you've seen induction on two variables, uh, whether there's a way, how, how do you generalize to induction on four variables? Um, Mm, I see, yeah. Um, so I would say that so far, the thing that we've looked into is just the variation that comes from the examples in the um, in the uh, uh, in the prompt. Sorry. So, for example, if we were to have uh, no induction proofs in the prompt, um, then this would probably lower the chance that the model would produce induction proofs. Um, so we do have some amount of diversity in the prompts in the sense that like we cover number theory and algebra, which are covered in this benchmark. Um, and we have a few examples of induction. Um, but beyond that, we just rely on the diversity from sampling from the model. And so, um, yeah, again, there, there's uh, definitely more to be explored. Got it, thanks. So uh, the next question, I'm not sure. So it's asking sledgehammer may prove more complex statements than what's acceptable in the a line of proof. How do you handle that? Um, the proof is correct, but not really a proof. I'm not sure uh, if I got that right, Pramadu, if you want to clarify, but yeah. Uh, let me see. It's acceptable. Um, yeah, if, if you wanted to clarify, that would that would be helpful. I, I think there's a few ways to, um, there's a few things to say. So like one is, um, uh, it is possible that the proof, that, that the formal proof ends up, for instance, like not using the informal proof. Um, and so for that, we um, did some analysis. Uh, I would say that um, uh, kind of informally, uh, it tends to happen on simpler proofs. So for instance, if it's like a straightforward induction proof, then uh, the model might be able to um, just generate something and none of the inline comments from the informal proof are used. Uh, whereas in the more sophisticated ones, uh, they tend to be, tend to be used. Um, does, that, does that kind of help answer? No, actually, I was more worried that it may not be one line of proof, really. I mean, it may be something which, you know, uh, Sledgehammer may reduce it, which actually requires, let's say, a thousand lines of formal proof. Mm -hmm. uh, in what sense have you proved it if you just um, use an automated theorem prover to prove it, right? So maybe that's not your goal. Um, mm -hmm. is, is the goal to create something which looks like a proof or not? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the kind of story was that was from a uh, informal proving perspective. 
but yeah, ultimately, um, it's kind of getting a formal proof at the end. And so, like you're saying, there's no restriction that it necessarily has to reflect the informal proof. Uh, yeah. Not the informal proof, uh, but what is a step of a proof? Usually, you know, every step of a proof has to be intelligible to the reader, right? Or, um, or maybe you don't require that. Maybe you just require that um, it be correct. Um, yeah, exactly. So here, ultimately, we just require that it's correct. So um, yeah, you could imagine having a really powerful automated prover that just proves a really large gap. Yeah. And then like if a human read it, uh, the gap would still be. So do you have any evidence that, let's say, the, uh, the example that you pr presented was not directly provable by the automatic theorem prover? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so in this one, in the one bar chart, uh, we use the automated prover along with additional hero six, and it gets about 20% performance on, a, on the benchmark, uh, whereas our system got near 40%. Okay, thank you. So the next, uh, I think someone had a couple of questions, but in the interest of time, I might just summarize like, so are there, um, can you say a little bit about what happens with complex theorems um, and where the proofs might need to be quite big? Mm -hmm. Can you handle these kinds of problems or uh, have any idea how to scale to that? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, it's always difficult to quantify. So I'd say qualitatively, there are examples where the proofs are very long and you could think about like, the reason for that is as long as each gap is still relatively small, um, then our system is kind of decomposing the problem into smaller, into um, smaller gaps. But, but you still um, have this codex step at the beginning that has to generate the large sketch, right? So if the sketch becomes long, then is that still, like maybe how long, how large of a sketch can you handle? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say quantitatively. Um, yeah, I would say like as long as um, you could imagine like some some example where it's like a long derivation, and so each step of the derivation is uh, kind of tractable for the formal prover, and there it almost doesn't matter how much how long the, the sketch is. Um, yeah. I had like another question, like what was the reason for choosing uh, Isabella over like some other proof assistant like Cock or something else? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, Cock would also work well with this, um, uh, you know, at least in theory. So yeah, Isabel, uh, we liked it because it had this kind of declarative style uh, as well as the sledgehammer um, functionality built in. Uh, and so again, like in theory, we could use any formal prover, uh, but for kind of doing the initial version of this project, Isabel was kind of a perfect match. So um, yeah, I don't know if you need to go or there are a couple more questions if you have time, but we can- Yeah, sure, quick. yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, Clement asked uh, if you've done any studies on similarity of problems and basically similarity of the training and test set uh, problems and proofs, whether there's overlap. I think you touched on this earlier. But... Yeah, so um, so in the informal proofs case, yeah, I'd mentioned how we split it according to make sure that the theorems were not um, referred to anywhere in the training set. Uh, then in the formal proofs case, um, we use this, this benchmark and so the benchmark consists of different competition problems. Um, and so there, there's going to be, um, uh, you know, a similar domain for the competition problems, um, but there's not gonna be overlap in the exact content of the problems themselves. Um, then in terms of the uh, overlap between uh, training and testing for the 
uh, for the large language models. So there we kind of have to defer to each component of the system. Um, so the Minerva model, they did their own analysis in the paper, um, actually with these competition level problems. And I don't think I'd be able to uh, like do it justice here, but I, I would say like, you can take a look at the Minerva paper there. And then the Codex model was actually trained before the formal benchmark was released. Um, so we do have some confidence that uh, it's actually generating, uh, you know, novel things here. Okay. Well, question was more on the yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can I ask a follow up? Mm -hmm. Sure. So my question was more on the line of like to what extent, like what part of the questions, like like it, it, in a sense, they added distance. Like for example, it might be this, a different problem, but only the constants might be changed, or only the wording of the problem might be changed. As in, like to what um, that that was just the 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 aspect I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so we didn't. So on the data set, since we were using the existing benchmark, we didn't do any additional analysis of of that type. Um, but I would say that like on this benchmark, it's drawn from different competition problems. Uh, and then it's still a relatively small benchmark. It's less than 500 problems. And so at this point, like people have looked through them. And um, yeah, I guess all I can say is that there's not uh, too much overlap in the exact uh, problems to, to the point where they'd be like the same, but with different numbers. Well, thanks. Um, so yeah, there are two more I see. So the next one, um, generating induction hypothesis can be pretty difficult for theorem provers. Do you have inductive proofs where they had to come up with some kind of induction hypothesis? And what, what did, did your technique successfully solve these? Um, yeah, so we did have a few uh, induction examples. Um, I think, so I didn't have them in the talk, but we do have two examples in, in the paper, in the appendix, if you're interested. Um, so, so yeah, it does show some ability to do uh, induction, um, but yeah, we haven't kind of systematically, uh, you know, characterized the ability to do induction. And the last question, uh, the pipeline seems highly dependent on Minerva providing a reasonable proof overview. So did you, uh, are, are you able to decouple this or be robust to bad summaries? Um, and what happens if Minerva is less powerful? Uh, does this still work? And when the model fails to create a proof, how often is it because of a bad summary? Do you have a sense? Yeah, so, okay. So yeah, there's a few things. So. Um, so yeah, first is like we we also study the setting uh, where we have a human written proof, um, and so there the system uh, is able to perform well with the human written proof. Um, then in terms of Minerva, uh, we studied both we studied the various sizes of Minerva as well as using Codex to generate the uh, the informal proof. Um, and so we, we found slight decreases in the um, performance from moving to say like from the 62 billion parameter model to eight billion parameters. And then codex was similar to eight billion Minerva. Um, so yeah, like we are using these par powerful uh, large language models. Um, and uh, we did see a slight degradation going from 62 billion to eight, um, but like the models are still able to do something reasonable at eight billion. But yeah, certainly the underlying informal prover, um, you know, if it's guiding these sketches, then it has to be uh, reasonably sophisticated. Um, so hopefully that answers that part. And then as far as the, when it is a bad summary, um, so let me see. I might have actually. So we did some analysis on this in in the paper, um, and maybe I won't be able to go into it in detail here. But we basically looked at fifty different drafts 
that led to a correct proof um, and then did some human evaluation on them. And so 29 of them were fully correct. Uh, and then 21 of them, I would classify them as uh, other. So they might have had um, like one line that was incorrect and it actually got corrected by the auto formalizer, meaning that like the line in the proof was slightly off, but then the resulting thing in the formal proof from a human perspective was uh, reasonable. Uh, uh, and then the 13 other cases, the proof um, kind of got ignored by the auto formalizer. So um, these, again, some of them were simple cases where, yeah, the auto formalizer was able to just use, say, like a standard induction argument uh, and didn't have to look at the informal proof. Okay, yeah, I think that's uh, all the questions. So thanks so much uh, again for the great talk and uh, thanks everyone for joining and I'll see you all next time. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Very impressive.